We are parents, teachers, and educators. And like you, we're passionate about restoring our culture for Christ. This is Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Hello again, and welcome to another episode of Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Today we have with us uh, someone who's quite familiar to uh, the Veritas family, a teacher at Veritas, but also the wife of our headmaster, Dr. Bob Cannon. Welcome, Carrie Cannon. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Uh, as you hear my introduction, uh, you might think that uh, this is about nepotism and, and that's why uh, uh, she gets to be on, the, uh, on Vox, but that's really not the case as you will learn very quickly. Carrie has really established herself uh, in a specific way that I'm pretty excited to talk about with her. But Carrie, before we get into that, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your family, which may be known to, to our community, but uh, also what you've been up to, especially um, in the last few years. Okay. So yes, I am the wife of Dr. Bob, and we have seven children. Uh, the oldest is 24, the youngest is 10. So that might change by the time somebody sees this. <laughs> that's true. Um, but there's that's some changes for me this upcoming year, as I will only be home educating three of our children. So I'm down to the minority home educating. Um, and I've spent mm, 18 years home educating. And it's changed a lot because in the beginning I had was home educating my oldest while taking care of toddlers and babies. And now I'm able to focus on home educating our children without having toddlers and babies. So it's really changed the way I educate our children. I know I leaned heavily on Veritas's um, curriculum in the beginning years when especially when my kids, older kids hit high school. Um, and so that was a real benefit to our family. And so, and it was about that time, I think when my older kids hit high school, I had been uh, a homeschool mom for basically 14 years and I was feeling burned out and I was going for a walk with Bob and he suggested I go back to college and finish my degree. And I thought that was uh, pretty ridiculous. Um, I Sure, you're burned out, so add to your lab, add to right. your load. <laughs> That's I have seven I children. I have a nursing baby. I'm starting to homeschool high school, and he suggests going back to finish my degree. But I did, and I spent about five years finishing. Um, actually, my previous college experience had been in uh, visual art, so I had taken courses um, at the college level in art. And so I went back because I realized that my real passion is literature. And so I went back and finished a bachelor's degree in literature. That's wonderful. And uh, I know that uh, I heard a, a little bit about your courses. Most of the work, as I understand it, was online with Harvard University, from whom your degree uh, was, was earned. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh, I, as you know, I like to teach a uh, tease Bob uh, about uh, him having gone to the University of Pens Pennsylvania and that that's a second tier Ivy League. Of course, here I am talking from a guy that went to NC State, a, a state school, uh, but that's become kind of an inside joke. But uh, it's the second tier because Harvard, uh, Princeton, and Yale tend to be considered what I would think of anyway as first year. So congratulations on that. Um, yeah. For those of you that have degrees from uh, uh uh, schools that are our Ivies that are listening, I'm sorry if that's insulting. I'm just I'm trying to have a little fun with it. Please don't take it too seriously. Um, but in recent years, I think at this point, as we record this, you're about to start your third year of an elective course called poetry. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So when I completed my degree, I was uh, just talking with Bob about what I might do going forward because I found as a homeschool mom, that I really needed that balance. I needed to be fed intellectually. And that really, I told you I was burned out, but having the challenge of my coursework, which was quite challenging, but having the conversation and being able to nourish myself with intellectual thought was making me stronger to be the homeschool mom that I needed to be. And I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't foresee how that could just end and I could keep homeschooling. And so 
Uh, I started teaching elective literature courses for Veritas and uh, I teach poetry and fairy tales. Um, that's wonderful. I'm glad you corrected me on that. I had forgotten that you were teaching uh, fairy tales also. These are two areas in not only in education, but in uh, what I'll call appreciation by the typical American citizen, the typical American, uh, the typical family. These are two areas that have kind of fallen on hard times uh, in uh, our lifetime. Uh, can you? Why do you think that is? Sure. So with poetry, uh, there has been a great cultural shift in understanding of what poetry is since the 20th century, I think really after the World Wars. So you, and, do you think World War II was a turning point? World War I was a turning point? Or what was going on there, maybe in them collectively in a gra more gradual thing? Maybe it's not quite so precise as a watershed moment, right. but help, help us understand that. Yeah, so what I've seen is in the 20th century, um, culturally what was happening there was a deconstruction in the art world at large. I mean, I saw that as I was studying visual art as well. And, but in poetry specifically, there's this deconstruction of what is poetry and a deconstruction of language. And so I feel that when I look at what is poetry, because that's a question that's often asked, what is poetry? How do you define poetry? And if you do a Google search of that today, you get, from all rep reputable sites, very different answers. And the definition of poetry since the 20th century changed from what it had previously been since its inception around 600 common era. And with the inception- Well, we don't use the term poetry. common era. <laughs> so Bob and I have this argument a lot. I use that term because of my experience at Harvard um, like Paul, how he wants to be all things to all people. Right. And I feel that that helped me to engage in conversation and uh, meeting the academics where they were. So I'll try to switch over. I can understand that a professor might have expected it, but not today. I have a different expectation, so you can meet mine today okay. instead of theirs. Okay. <laughs> um, so from the uh, 6th century AD, um, the inception of English poetry, in poetry was understood to be a certain thing. And if you had asked someone way back then, you know, why is poetry important? They wouldn't necessarily have even understood the question because it was such a part of their culture. And that po that definition of poetry remained the same for 1500 years until then. How would, what would be a good succinct definition that we might see before the 20th century? Right. Um, I'll tell you what I tell my students when they're writing poetry. Um, and again, I'm not looking at poetry from the 20th century onward. I'm looking backward at what has poetry understood to be historically English poetry for 1500 years. And, and that is number one, because it is a tool of communication, it follows grammatical rules uh, because sentences are the way our words make sense to us. And so if we wanna make sense in communicating to other people, we need to okay. use the rules of sentences. Um, but what's different about poetry and prose is that poetry has uh, always been an oral art form. And so it has sound patterns and that might be rhyme. It wasn't always rhyme. Um, it can be meter rhythms. <laughs> sound patterns are an important aspect of poetry and then figurative language. So if you keep those three things together and look over the 1500 years from its inception, you can see that this is a, a rough description of what is poetry. So that would be the case until we see things changing in the 20th century. Where would we find ourselves today by in what would be a generally accepted definition of poetry? Uh, it's difficult to say because there's, so I'll just tell this quick story. When I was in art school the first year, 
one of my professors asked, there was a classroom of about 30 students and said, um, does anybody believe in absolutes? And I was the only student that raised my hand out of 30 students. I was shocked. I thought I might be a minority, but I was the only one. There and it lies a logical conundrum that's obvious to some of us and maybe not all of us, but it's worth right. noting. And that is if somebody says, I don't believe in absolutes, the logical conundrum is that they just made an absolute. Right. Definitely. So how I responded, I because I'm with a bunch of artists and I said, okay, if you don't believe in absolutes, then that means that art is not an absolute and anything is art, which means anyone is an artist. Everyone is an artist. And honestly, that didn't bother anybody there. And that's where visual art has gone. Anything is art and everyone can, and anyone can be an artist. It's just whatever you hang on the wall. And poetry has taken really the same, you know, the same, followed that same progress where anything is poetry now. Modernism and, and postmodernism's influences. Right. Yes. So it's difficult to pin down, you know, what is the definition of poetry today? Because it depends on who you ask. Yeah. I understand that. It, if I went to uh, a coffee shop reading of poetry, which would maybe be the best example it might be more more appropriate to say in a college campus but uh i would i would hear people reading things or saying things would would meter and the sound of it being spoken not have some even informal general acceptance at that point it can and um I honestly think that the pendulum may be swinging back that direction. Um, and when things lose complete meaning and complete definition, right. they, they become everything for everybody. Right. That tends to be the end of the road. And somebody says, now I want it to mean something. Right. So I'm seeing a movement of poets moving back towards some formal definition and um, boundaries of what is poetry. But again, it really depends on who you ask, because I also did an undergraduate research project for a professor. And one of the things I was researching was sound poetry, in which you might go to this coffee shop and hear this poet, you're told, come hear this poet, they're going to recite their poetry, and they stand up and they're just making noises with their mouth. There's no words. There's not really any meaning. There's, uh, you know, it's just noises. And so that would be considered poetry by many today. Yeah, that's pretty bizarre. Well, let's move in. The, the classes that you teach have really started to gain traction because uh, we... Uh, parents and administrators, et cetera, have seen the exciting things of thinking about poetry in an historic sense. So we're, it, so that uh, our listeners understand, we're not adopting a modernist or postmodern definition of poetry. We're taking that classic, that historic definition and applying it to our academic pursuits. And you mentioned, uh, you didn't mention it here, I, this is from a prior conversation, that the other thing that disappeared is the overwhelming Christian influence in poetry. Right. Let me, let me ask a question about that. Sorry. What is, is, is that, is the post-Christian element that we're dealing with connected to that and how, if you can uh, identify it? Yes. So as I'm seeing the pendulum possibly beginning to swing back. And at the same time, as I was researching for teaching this course and realizing this, what in my undergraduate work at a secular school, I didn't really see the strong thread of Christianity running through English poetry and how that was such an influence on poetry and what is poetry and how poetry developed over time historically English poetry and so it's it's my um uh it's my idea that as Christians return back to looking at those 
poets from history, that they should be the ones, again, it should be through Christianity that poetry is reborn, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I'll bet that there's a lot of acceptance to sure. that by our parents and students then. How, what, talk to us about the, um, the class objectives then and how those play out in uh, efforts to, well, I'll say rebirth an interest in poetry and why that's so important. So uh, I do hope that I inspire the next generation of poets, Christian poets specifically. So that is one of my desires, but my objective for the class is that for all of the students that I would incite in them a lifelong habit of reading poetry. So whether or not they're going to become a poet and write poetry, we do some of both in the class. We read poetry, we write poetry, and we recite poetry, which is also a lost art form. So uh, Does we do recite mean memorize, to and memorize and then speak it? And then to present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It used to be a, a common part of your education for centuries, and it seems to not uh, just even just memorizing information and having to then present it isn't as uh, as um, common today as it was. So trying to bring back reciting poetry and reading poetry aloud is very important because, again, it was an oral art form. And then when it became written, it still retained a lot of the its oral features, but some of those became lost. And then as people weren't reciting poetry anymore, you know, then you can see how it's all starting to sort of crumble down. Right. And so as a, as a teacher, I really want to, as I said, I hope that some of my students will go on and become poets, but I hope that all of my students will just make it a lifelong habit to continue engaging with poetry, reading poetry, because I think that's where it needs to start. Yeah. We didn't talk really at all, although there's a sense in which it's a first cousin and a lot of things are related, but how does the teaching of fairy tales uh, look in comparison both to what you're doing in poetry and how fairy tales have been regarded over time? It's been really interesting because as I've been preparing for both of these courses, I keep, they keep overlapping these and, um, and I'll see the same authors overlapping. And actually this summer, some of my students from both classes said they wanted to do a book club over the summer just for fun with me. Oh, they, wow. said, we, they said, we want to do, do a, that. Yeah. So I've been oh, doing it. That's that is yeah. great. They said, let me just, um, let me just yeah. pause parenthetically here for a moment and say that's, the kind of thing that gets me up in the morning to hear that our teachers, that the people that work at Veritas are so committed to the work and the ministry that they do things that we don't even know about that are just further enhancing what we care about. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Oh, it's been delightful. I've been enjoying meeting with them. They really pushed it. The whole thing was their idea. And I even said to them, I tried to talk them out of it. I said, you're going to finish the school year. Some of them are graduating. I was like, you're going to college. You're setting sites. I was like, you don't want to come back and talk about poetry with me this summer. <laughs> and they said, no, we wanted, they were like, we want to keep doing what we do in class every day, but without grades. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> so that's what we've been doing. But so I had students from both classes, poetry and fairy tales all together. And at first I thought, well, what are we going to read? And I wanted to pick something that would appeal to both audiences. And I discovered it's not difficult at all, that there's so much overlap between fairy tales and poetry studies. Um, I've just been astonished at the overlap. So that's been fun to find. Well, give us a definition of the category that we call fairy tales. Okay, so fairy tales, you have folklore, which tends to be stories that have been passed down orally over time. Sometimes they may have originated as a written story. And then, um, so we have what's called secondary orality, which is cultures where um, they're hearing read stories. So like the majority of the culture isn't literate, but there's some people in the culture who are literate. And so sometimes you have, you know, like a Greek 
written story. So our Beauty and the Beast tale, we think comes from the Cupid and Psyche story, originally was really? written, written, written down, but then that was told orally to people who couldn't read. And so then the story starts to morph and change. And the fairy tales, I'm going to- but I mean, If I may, Beauty and the Beast would be more relatable to many people than Cupid and Psyche who may not have uh, the uh, background in Greek mythology. Right. So the Beauty and the Beast tale that we think of today is mostly from a French tradition from uh, the 17th century. So it's much closer in time. So yeah. there's themes that are more relatable to us yeah. than in ancient yeah. tradition, definitely. Um, but so um, I'll take, so that's folklore, you know, these oral tales that have been told, whether they originated as a written tale or not, they've been these oral tales that have, tales that have been told. What makes it a fairy tale is not that there's fairies in the story, because many of our fairy tales, in fact, most of, if not all of Grimm's fairy tales don't have any fairies in them at all, but that they take place. And this is from J.R.R. Tolkien. He wrote this wonderful essay on fairy stories. And so he, he actually didn't write it. He wrote it down afterwards. It was a lecture that he gave at, uh, at, at uh, St. Andrew's University. Um, so he says, what makes it a fairy tale is that it takes place in fairy, as in the land of fairy. So basically there's some sort of magical element in the tale. It, that's what differentiates a fairy tale from folklore. So it would not necessarily, a fairy tale of course, would not have a rhythmic element like poetry in its classic definition. It would be longer, it would be written or, or spoken but it would be more narrative than it would be with some sort of cadence or something about hearing it that would be significant. So that's where there's a lot of overlap. So one of the books that I read in the book club was The Lays of Marie de France, who was a medieval um, woman in England. And she was writing these poems in like a, an early version of like an Anglo-Norman language. And a lot of them are fairy tales, but they're also poems. And so there's definitely an overlap because I think also today, um, even through the 19th century, like if you think of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, there was more tradition of narrative poetry. So, I mean, go all the way back to Homer, that's narrative poetry, poetry that tells a story. Sure. But with the romantics starting at the end of the 19th century, they were really breaking away from that and writing more lyric poetry, which is what we think of, I think, today. If I say poetry, I think that's what people think of. They think of lyric poetry. So if you're in looking at all of a greater definition of poetry, narrative poetry, including, you're going to find fairy tales that are written as poems. So now the big question, mm -hmm. because this is a question that kids like to ask, why does this stuff matter? <laughs> okay, so... Um, I'll answer the question for poetry, but I just remembered one more thing about fairy tales and their overlap with poetry. Sure. And that's the first book that I use, the first text that I use for the fairy tale class is Perrault's fairy tales, which are the French fairy tales from the 17th century. And his first publication of fairy tales were all poems. I kind of just realized that because I just teach them as narrative. I don't yeah. teach them as poems, but he wrote them all as poems. There's four or five uh, narrative poems and they're the fairy tales. Um, so why does poetry matter? Um, there's many reasons, but I'll, I'll focus on um, two if we have time for two if um, that are most important to me. And the first one is that poetry connects us to God. And we see a wonderful example of that in the Bible. And that is the Bible we think of as God's word to us. Sure. But the Psalms are written almost completely in the first person. And so the Psalms are really our words to God. And that's poetry in, you know, from the Hebrew tradition, we see that poetry is the, the form of literature that's connecting us to God. You know, it's our words to him. And then you can trace that with Homer's poetry, for instance, in, in the Greek tradition, 
when they were reciting these poems, they would, uh, someone would recite the poems at their different feasts and festivals, they would get together. And it was a religious ritual. It wasn't just to remember the story. It wasn't just to remember the battles that happened or the heroes. It was specifically to connect them to their gods. They believed there was this invisible okay. link between from the gods to the poet to the people. And they didn't have an opportunity for uh, salvation like we do. And so any opportunity that they could link somehow with immortality, right. their poetry did that for them. English poetry, I've talked about when English poetry began, our first English poet that we know by name is Cadman. And Bede tells the story in, um, in his history of the English church. And it is through a miracle that Cadman is given the ability to create a poem and he, his poem is the first English poem that we have, and we have it, Bede's manuscript is in Latin. In a couple manuscript versions, some scribes have written the old English words of Cadman's poem. So oh. our first written English poem is, it's not long, it's maybe eight to 10 lines, and it's simply epithets of God as creator praising him. That's our first English poem. That to me is so exciting. So again, you know, that poetry is, is our way of linking to God. It's a language almost that God seems to have given to us to be able to communicate with him. Um, and then my second reason why if poetry is important is that poets are, um, are word builders. So, you know, in the VSA culture, I think fantasy literature is is really really loved, and so we have Tolkien and Lewis, and they were world builders, right? They built sure. Middle, they built Narnia, and everyone loves that. But uh, poets are word builders; they're the ones who are creating our language. And so back to where we started in the 20th century, the poets start deconstructing, and our language is deconstructing. But poets are the ones historically who built language. They weren't just writing poetry to say, look at how masterful I am with language, but they were writing poetry to show, look at the possibilities of, of what you can do with English language. Look what English can do as a language. Look at what it can express. Yeah, I, I, I think that's wonderful. What, what difference does it make? And maybe it is more... Uh, a consequence rather than a cause. And if it's a consequence, then the difference is found in the cause that may be, may be different. But what difference does it make that the definition of poetry has degraded in such a way in uh, uh, really our lifetime and slightly before? I think that really just touches back to the themes that we've already talked about that um, if we're losing the definition of poetry, then we lose poetry as an art form and we lose the importance of poetry. Poetry used to be a part of people's everyday lives. So in, during the Anglo-Saxon culture, uh, poetry was their storytelling, but it was their um, way of remembering. And so it was important for remembering historic events, remembering genealogies. And so it had a great significance but even if you go back to the 19th century, poetry was a part of every person's daily reading in their newspaper. It was a part of your education. We talked about the importance of reciting poetry. It was every, um, every any time of people assembled, whether it was for church or for any type of event, poetry was read and performed. And we've completely lost that as a culture. Um, so we have the upcoming, I won't get into politics because I'm not, that's not my field, but there's this very interesting, I tell this to my students because again, I'm trying, I'm hoping to motivate one of them at least to become a poet, right? But um, so with our inaugurations since JFK, he um, had a poet speak at the inauguration and since then, it's only been Democratic presidents who have had poets speak at the inauguration. Interesting. Yes. Well, um, it seems to me, from what you're saying, that a loss of poetry that has been the case 
in some senses for our entire existence, that is the people that now live. And so we have some need to recover this and understand from things that we didn't get from our parents and didn't experience ourselves. But it seems like a loss of poetry is somewhat a loss of what it means to be human in God's creation. Mm. That's really insightful. And um, it's definitely a loss of a part of the a language and art form that he gave us. And so I hadn't really thought of it as that, but as, um, you know, wanting to hold on to, you know, we're created in his image and the fullness of, of him yeah. to not lose that art form. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you. Thank you. Folks, thank you again for joining us on another episode of Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. We look forward to seeing you next time.